I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 25 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice to, to, that today I propose to move in quotes, that in the opinion of the Senate, the following matter is of urgency. The urgent need for the Morrison government to announce science-based 2030 targets to protect Australian exporters from overseas carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Is the proposal supported? Uh, I understand Thank you, Senators. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Um, thank you. Senator Waters, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I, I move that motion that you just uh, read in. In the last few weeks and months, everything about the global fight on the climate emergency has changed. 2030 targets, net zero commitments, coal and gas exports, and now carbon tariffs. Uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced last week that he wants to use June's G7 meeting to forge an alliance on carbon border adjustment mechanisms. And while this government is trying to secure a free trade agreement with the European Union, the EU ambassador has urged us to embrace, quote, more ambitious and emboldened, end quote, climate policies. Japan, a country that accepts 40 per cent of Australia's LNG exports and over a third of our thermal coal expo exports, is set to make a decision by July on its own carbon border adjustment mechanism. And in the platform that he took to the 2020 election, President Biden said that his administration will, and I quote, impose carbon adjustment fees or quotas on carbon intensive goods from countries that are failing to meet their climate and environmental obligations, and will also condition future trade agreements on partners' commitments to meet their enhanced Paris climate targets, end quote. We already know that this government has turned Australia into a global pariah when it comes to climate action, and that we face the scorn of the international community when it comes uh, to doing our fair share to reduce emissions. Uh, Prime Minister Morrison was refused an invite to the UN Climate Ambition Summit late last year. The former Prime Minister of Tuvalu has said that the Prime Minister's actions at the 2019 Pacific Islands Forum communicated the view that Pacific leaders should, quote, take the money, then shut up about climate change." End quote. This government has spent the last two meetings of the Paris Agreement begging the rest of the world to let Australia cheat on our emissions accounting by using Kyoto-era carryover credits, something that no other country is intending to use. But now it looks like Australia's exporters will have to wear the consequences of this government's go-slow approach as well, and we don't know how far the consequences could go. Maybe there'll be tariffs based on the carbon intensity of our goods. And all of the exporters who rely on our dirty coal-based electricity that this government refuses to transition off will get whacked with a big fee. Maybe the tariffs will be general and impact all exporters, which could see even low-carbon exporters hit with tariffs due to this government's inaction. We don't know yet, and given the nature of these global trade agreements, there is every chance that we won't have much of a say. What's so sad about this is that it doesn't need to be this way. We had a price on carbon, and it worked. We brought down energy emissions by 12 million tonnes in just the two years before it was repealed, the only time prior to COVID that that's happened in this country. We are blessed with the resources of the sun and the wind. We have the engineering and technical know-how to rapidly transform our economy. But politics, the politics of the big parties and the big coal and gas corporations who pay for their campaigns, continues to get in the way. We have two options available to us. We can continue to double down on our fossil fuel obsession while the rest of the world leaves Australia behind, or we can do our fair share to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, adopt science-based 2030 targets and make a proper plan to meet them. There is no other option. You hear from the government that somehow we can close our eyes and wish it all away. Minister Taylor has said that he's dead against carbon tariffs. Well, I'm sorry, Minister, but that's not how it works. You can be dead against them all you like, but if we want to be part of the global community, 
We can't just unilaterally decide to shirk our responsibility on emissions. That's the choice, a jobs-rich transformation to a low-carbon economy or a poorer, hotter, more dangerous and more insular Australia. This government faces a series of very serious threats over the coming months. President Biden's April climate summit, the G7 meeting in June, the 2021 Pacific Islands Forum, and finally COP26 in Glasgow in November. And while talk of preferably by 2050 might be a balm for those who want to delay action, it is what we do and what we say over the next decade that counts. It is science-based 2030 targets and the next decade that will be debated at the Biden summit and at the G7 and at COP26. The decisions that this government makes over the coming months will set the course not only for the future of the fight on climate change, but the future of Australia's role in the world. The eyes of the world are on us, and if this government fails again, there will be consequences. Senator Ca Sorry, Canavan. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, well, um, look, I think it's, uh, it's great that the Greens have uh, moved this, uh, this motion this evening in the Senate uh, because it once again highlights uh, the, uh, the difficulty that the Greens political party seem to have in conceiving of the concept of democracy. Uh, it's, I thought, a pretty simple system we have here. Uh, a tough system, but a simple one, where we have these things called elections in our country every three years for the federal parliament, and there's certain policies put forward by different political parties at those elections. The Australian people choose uh, uh, which of those uh, parties or groups they'd like to rule them, and those policies then are generally, hopefully, implemented. The promises are kept, hopefully, and, and, uh, and passed through uh, this place. But of course, the Greens don't like what the Australian people have said over the past decade, so now they're hoping, wishing, praying. Uh, trying to get through this place, that we encourage other nations to rule us. <laughs> we encourage other countries uh, to tell us what we should do here in this country and how we should govern ourselves. The Greens want to effectively disenfranchise the Australian people and say, your views are simple, your views uh, are not sophisticated enough, your views don't accord with a globalist agenda that other countries have adopted, so they should be imposed on you regardless of what you vote for or who you support. That is the position of this motion. Because the position of this motion says that we should, we should uh, adopt, and, and Senator Waters just outlined there, adopt carbon taxes, carbon prices very soon, because so we can avoid other countries trying to force us to do something through carbon adjustment border mechanisms or otherwise just tariffs and taxes on us. So because the Greens haven't been able to convince the Australian people to impose a tax on themselves, they want uh, wishing and hoping other countries impose a tax on this country. I mean, how un-Australian can you get? Uh, whatever your views are on what we should do on climate change, how could you credibly sit there and be wishing and praying other countries to tax Australia? That is what this motion calls for. Anyone who supports it, the Labor Party gets them to support it. They are supporting other countries taxing this country, taxing our jobs, taking away our income and making us poor as a nation uh, because of it. And let's just go through the record here. Let's just spell out the track record of the last decade in terms of putting forward policies of this na nature, uh, putting forward carbon taxes and carbon prices or whatever you want to call it. There have been lots of names that I'll go through. Let's go through and see what the Australian people decided. Because this did start about a decade ago uh, when then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd adopted a carbon pollution reduction scheme, a CPRS at the time. Uh, and he, he did have it for a while, it then became a bit tough for him. It was the greatest moral challenge of our time, and then it wasn't. But we went to the election in 2010 and the Labor Party they effectively lost, or it was a draw, really, and then they had to get the support of some country independents to govern. The Australian people weren't too happy with the CPRS, who Rudd had sort of had got rid of it beforehand. And, and Julia Gillard, Miss Gillard, then stood at that election saying there'll be no carbon tax under a government lead. The Australian people voted for parties. Neither party had a carbon tax in their policy. In fact, the, then the, what, the, the, the leader of the political party that became the Prime Minister explicitly said she would not impose a carbon tax. Anyway, that promise was broken and uh, the Labor government at the time went against the will of the Australian people, imposed that tax and it played a big part in the fact that they got smashed in the 2013 election and lost on a policy of a carbon tax. Another loss for a carbon tax. In 2016, uh, Mr Mark Butler, uh, 
Oh, may he rest now. He's no longer the Shadow Climate Minister, but Mr Bark Butler took forward an emissions intensity scheme to the 2016 election. Another loss for the Labor Party. That was defeated at the 2016 election. The Australian people rejected that too. And then a couple of years ago in 2019, uh, Mr Bill Shorten took forward a policy of a 45 per cent reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. It was a bit unclear whether it would be through a carbon price, carbon tax, but it was a significantly larger emission reduction that the coalition policy had committed to it. Paris, again, again, rejected by the Australian people. So we're 0 from 4 here. We're 0 from 4 uh, for a carbon tax or a carbon price over the last decade. Yet still we hear the Greens and I don't know, maybe Labor here this afternoon, wishing, hoping and praying that a carbon tax will be imposed on Australian, the Australian people by hook or by crook or however means they can necessary. Now we should we should, instead of cheering on other countries imposing taxes on our own jobs, our own income, our own wealth, our own people, uh, we should be standing up for what we are doing right in this country and the hypocrisy of other nations that would seek to do these things. I think the chances of these border adjustments are very remote, very remote, for the very simple reason that if other countries adopt them, they'd have to apply them to themselves. They'd have to, to be anyway consistent. They'd have to apply them to themselves. Uh, uh, in, in Europe, where a lot of these calls are coming from, in Europe, 21 of the 27 countries in Europe are not on track to meet their Paris commitment. So what are they going to do? Are they going to impose it on? Are they going to reintroduce tariffs within Europe? Are they going to get rid of the EU if they're applying this policy and it's being applied to, to parties or members who are not meeting their climate change goals? Well, there should be the reimposition of tariffs between and among European countries for those countries that are laggards and are not meeting their targets. In fact, just last week a French court ruled, the French court ruled that the French government uh, is not meeting its Paris commitments right now. So are they going to apply these taxes themselves? I don't think they will. I don't think they will. They seem like empty threats. And then you go back to the Kyoto Agreement, which came due last year. The Kyoto Agreement commitments were made in 1997, I believe. I might be getting that date wrong, sometime in the late 1990s. The Kyoto Agreement was finalised. Uh, countries made various commitments to cut their emissions by 2020. A lot of countries didn't meet that target. We did. Australia met our, our commitments and our targets, but Canada didn't meet their targets. New Zealand didn't meet their targets. Are they going to impose car carbon adjustment border mechanisms on themselves? How are they going to tax their own products? I don't know. How are they going to tariff your own products? Uh, an internal tariff would be an interesting thing to impose, but that would be the rationale under this, this scheme. We should be fighting against this hypocrisy and pointing out that that kind of behaviour could not be tolerated at all at any international level. And we should also, if we believe, if we believe in the international rules trading system and believe in free trade, which has come under a lot of pressure in the last 20 years for reasons well outside this debate, uh, if we want to continue to support that, where does this all go? What happens when a country turns around and says, well, we're going to do this if you, if you keep culling your kangaroo herd? We're going to impose a carbon adjustment border mechanism on you. How much more national sovereignty will be, uh, will be impinged based on other countries in threatening or imposing tariffs on another nation. This strikes the heart of the Westphalian uh, uh, national system, that other countries should not be able to dictate the policies of another nation. And, and, and for that reason, I cannot see this particular proposal getting anywhere past first base. It hasn't yet. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of threats, a lot of smoke and mirrors. But really, it would completely destroy the, the system of uh, nation-state governance and, and cordial relations between ourselves if it was to come into place, because it goes beyond well just climate change if this were to happen. And then finally, I did want to <coughs> um, focus a little bit on the inherent absurdity on a lot of these uh, particular proposals uh, to save the planet through global action right now in the current environment, because I imagine that if these mechanisms were to come into place, uh, you know, if carbon tariffs were to be put into place, they would not just be applied to Australia, they'd have to be applied to other countries too. And I wonder how they're going to be enforced and checked. I wonder how other nations will determine whether a particular country is breaching its commitments and therefore deserves to have a carbon tariff imposed uh, on them, uh, particularly in the context of what we've seen in the past week. In the past week, We've seen international observers from the World Health Organization travel to China, spend months in China, trying to uncover the origins of the coronavirus. They came back empty-handed. They came back empty-handed. Indeed, it's been revealed this week that there are hundreds of samples, blood samples, that China is not sharing uh, with these inspectors. 
uh, and they have not been able to come to any really worthwhile conclusions about the origins of the coronavirus. Now, apparently, those, of, uh, those in this chamber who are taking this threat of carbon tariffs seriously, apparently, where those health inspectors failed, climate inspectors from, say, the IPCC in the future will have no problems uh, enforcing and disciplining countries like China and finding out whether they really are meeting their net zero targets. Does anyone believe this absurdity? Does anyone believe that China is going to allow climate inspectors into its country and determine how many coal-fired power stations it's got going, how much emissions it is producing? No way, no way hell would freeze over before that would happen. So this whole motion is built on a mountain of absurdity. And Senator Waters, at the end of her contribution, mentioned that there are only two options. We either cut our emissions or become subject to all of these tariffs. Well, I would posit a third, a third option where we maybe, maybe just listen to the Australian people. That's, that's another option. Another option is we actually, a radical option, Senator Brockman, a radical option would be that we listen to the Australian people, we let democracy decide what we do in this country, and we make it very clear to other nations that we will not have any truck with other countries that want to impinge on our democratic rights, our sovereign and independent rights as a nation to decide the policies that are, that are imposed on the Australian people. We respect other countries' rights in that regard, and we expect the same in return. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Call the Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get up and speak on these motions um, drafted by the Greens, but seemingly sometimes I wonder whether um, Senator Canavan drafts them himself and sends them over to the Greens so he can have the opportunity to speak um, uh, about his favourite subject, um, and that is um, all the things the Greens are doing wrong, um, but not actually what the government is doing right. While I don't agree with every aspect of this motion, um, there are parts that I agree with and that we need to discuss in this place. I do agree that policy should be science-based. And that is a real problem for this government. We know that we've uh, recently uh, been dealing with the pandemic and we've had alternative facts from members of this government, um, alternative facts about cures and about processes, about the coronavirus itself, about vaccines. This is a government unable to deal with the members in its caucus, in its government, that can't accept science that rally against science, that see science as something that should be debated. We saw the Deputy Prime Minister in an interview say that uh, sometimes uh, facts are up for debate. But science shouldn't be up for debate when it is so crucial and so important when it comes to public health. And we know that there are members of the government that rally against the science of climate change. And they rally against the science that is about protecting the public health. Climate change is a risk to public health. And this government has members sitting on the other benches over there that uh, sit in, I've sat in committees myself where scientists have been attacked have been derailed, questioned about the science that they are presenting. Uh, and it's extraordinary to witness this sort of behaviour from a government that um, uh, you know, should be uh, applying the best possible science to its policy making. But we know that that doesn't happen. And that's why this government has really struggled, really struggled to make any headway when it comes to climate action, when it comes to dealing with carbon emissions. And it's why we are at a real risk of not getting our health response to this pandemic correct. I do agree with the other part of this uh, motion that this is an urgent matter. And it's urgent because there's not enough certainty for businesses and for workers out there. And it's not, uh, there's not enough urgency about what the plan is around targets and around carbon emissions and around our energy market. Because we know that there are businesses out there that are looking to the government for guidance. They want to make decisions about the future. These businesses aren't making 12-month plans. They're making 10-year plans. 
and they need to know from this government what are the parameters that they are working with. But unfortunately, we know with the LNP what happens is someone comes up with an idea, then the nationals come over to the joint party room and say, that's not going to happen, we don't want to do that, and everyone gives up and walks away. I do agree with the implicit, uh, the inference in this motion that it would be much better for workers, for jobs, for our trading uh, exporters if members of this government, particularly the nationals, are kept as far away from energy and manufacturing policy as possible. Because all they have managed to do is hold back our regions and our industries. We know in parts of regional Queensland, the parts of our country that members opposite talk about all the time in terms of protecting jobs and, and standing up for the regions, that these are parts of our country that can have a jobs boom when it comes to renewable energy and getting our energy mix right. We have in far north Queensland a real problem when it comes to jobs right now. I've spent a lot of time in this chamber arguing that this government should step in and support tourism operators. And they're not doing a job about they're not doing what they should be doing when it comes to supporting tourism operators. But what they also haven't done is over the last seven years, given a town like Cairns a plan about diversifying the economy. They haven't been able to say where other jobs might be able to come from because we know there might be another pilot strike, there might be another COVID-19. But for seven years, there has been no diversification of jobs. When it comes to renewable energy, we can create jobs in far north Queensland. We have wind, we have solar, and we can create thousands and thousands of jobs if we get the settings right. We've got a fantastic wind farm in far north Queensland. It's called the Mount Emerald Wind Farm, and I've visited it recently. Uh, and it's got um, 53 wind turbines. Every single one of those wind turbines was manufactured overseas. And I look at these huge constructions and the workers that uh, take so much pride in maintaining that facility. But I, I, it's a real mi miss and it's a real missed opportunity that we haven't been able to manufacture those wind turbines right here in Australia. So when we're talking about targets and we're talking about plans, we're talking about the government walking away from net zero emissions at 2050. This is what we're talking about on this side of the chamber. It's the jobs that are going missing. It's the businesses that don't have certainty. It's the businesses that are crying out for cheaper energy prices so they can manufacture things like wind turbines, so we can build trains in regional Queensland, so we can build and maintain ships in regional Queensland, but they can't do it if they don't know what the energy setting policies will be over the next 5, 10, 15 years. We ask these businesses, these fantastic family and local businesses, to make long-term investments in our regions. But without knowing what the policy settings will be, they're unable to do that. And the Morrison government has repeatedly refused to commit to a target of net zero emissions by 2050, declaring that the government's plan is to achieve net zero emissions in the second half of the century. And you really have to wonder why they're unable to commit to this target alone. Well, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, and members of the National Party have made it clear that the reason that they don't want to commit to a 2050 target is that they won't be in Parliament in 2050. It's that sort of short-sightedness that really irks members of the public in regional Queensland. It's that sort of short-sightedness that has led to uh, a situation where we don't have diversification of our economy in regional Queensland. Renewable jobs could boom by 44,000 jobs by 2025, but only with the right policy support energy, in renewable energy could employ as many as 40,000 Australian workers, an almost doubling of the 25,000 workers that work in the sector right now. 
but only with the right policy settings, only with the commitment from this government and only with the establishment of a robust and secure workforce. In far north Queensland, we know that when it comes to science and saving jobs, taking action on climate change, there's no better example of what's at risk than the impact on the Great Barrier Reef. And right now, we are uh, um, trying to support businesses that are uh, have their hearts breaking at the moment. Like I, in the last couple of days, last week or so, I've spoken to tourism operators that are really, really struggling. And they are really struggling because this government has shown complete lack of concern over their businesses. Grown men are crying, their, their hearts are breaking because they just uh, know that their um, businesses are at real risk if this government isn't able to support them. But the risk going forward through the pandemic is that we don't get our climate action settings right and the impacts on the Great Barrier Reef are irreversible. Because without flights coming into Cairns right now from the international visitors, our tourism businesses are struggling. But if there's no reef to visit, then those planes will stop forever. They will stop forever. And we need to back in these businesses and these local jobs. And the only way to do that is with giving some certainty around targets. Thank you, Senator Green. I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I welcome the opportunity to talk about energy security and energy affordability. The European Union has threatened to impose a tariff on our exports to punish Australians for not having destroyed as much of our economy as the Europeans have destroyed of theirs with ruinous renewable energy. At the same time the, UN, the EU, EU is in the grip of record cold, solar panels over there are covered in snow and windmills are frozen solid. Germany, the home of the Greens, has just opened a new heli coal plant, Datteln 4, which has 1,100 megawatts of reliable baseload coal power which is proving the difference between keeping the lights on and sitting in the cold and the dark. Heating and cooling are not optional to the elderly and the infirm. They are essential. Energy security and energy affordability. The welfare of Australians must be our foremost consideration in energy policy. Yet in Australia, the Greens insist on pursuing a strategy that will cr create a hostile energy environment. The old parties, Liberal, Labor and the Nationals have joined in. In Western Australia, the Liberal Nationals have announced a plan to close their coal power plants by 2025, four years' time. The New South Wales Liberal Nationals are closing Liddell coal power plant in 2023. ALP policy. Well, you know, they want to shut down half of our coal-fired power by 2030. At least I think that's right. The ALP policy changes depending on, on who's telling the story and where they're telling the story. Every major party has the same policy, to close our baseload power plants without first building replacements. One Nation is the only party with an energy plan that will provide for Australia's energy security now and in the future. We will build a 2,000 megawatt hydro plant near Townsville and micro hydro across the grid. One Nation will build high efficiency, low emission heli coal plants in the Hunter and at Collinsville in Queensland. One Nation's plan will bring back manufacturing and jobs, deliver employment security and higher wages, in short, a better standard of living for all Australians. I'll say it again, One Nation is the only party of energy security and energy affordability. I want to mention a phrase that used in the Greens notice motion science based 2030 energy policy senator ian macdonald in 2016 in december said that the science has never been debated in this parliament never until senator roberts raised it and i can still say it's never been debated because no one will debate it it's been 515 days now since i last challenged since i first challenged in the senate the Greens leader, Larissa Waters, Senator Waters and 
Senator Di Natale at the time to a debate on the empirical scientific evidence for their claim and on the corruption of climate science. Not once have they provided that evidence. Not once have they accepted a debate. It's 10 years, over 10 years now, nearly 10 and a half years since I first challenged Senator Waters at a debate at the powerhouse in New Farm on Thursday, the 7th of October 2010. And Senator Canavan talks about nationals' policy. They went to the last election with a policy for coal, and every policy since has said nothing of coal. Only one nation is the, is the party of energy security and energy affordability. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, another day, another motion of urgency from the Greens, where it's all about ruining Australian business, ruining jobs and all about virtue signalling. Well, it's clear to all senators, I believe, and to all Australians that the Greens are not a party of action. They are not a party of government. They are a party of protest and a party that relies solely on selling fear, knowing that they will never, ever have to come up with a plan that works. And this motion today shows exactly that. This motion is not about the Greens providing suggestions on how the Morrison government can achieve zero emissions. They are solely suggesting the Morrison government makes virtue signalling announcements. This government that I'm a part of is focused on results, not hollow promises. All this motion does today is encourage foreign countries to impose tariffs and taxes on Australian business with the likely effect of destroying Australian jobs, Australian industries and Australian families. The actions of the Greens today in providing cover and support for foreign countries to apply tariffs on Australian products is despicable. The Greens should be ashamed of themselves. Because, Madam Acting Deputy President, what do the Greens get out of putting forward a motion such as this? Maybe a headline? Maybe a social media post? A tweet? And providing cover for foreign, tax, foreign countries to tax Australian businesses. What is really disappointing about this motion is that the Greens know full well that the Australian government is taking real action to reduce our emissions. We have set targets, we smashed Kyoto and we are on our way to meeting and beating our Paris obligations. What we know for certain is that it's outcomes that matter, actions and outcomes. The Morrison government is taking real and practical and pragmatic action and delivering real outcomes. As a result of the actions we are taking, we are delivering lower emissions while protecting our economy, jobs and investment. We have strong targets, an enviable track record and a clear plan. Our plan is driven by technology and not taxes. And mostly, and most importantly, our plan is working. While ambition is important, achievement and outcomes are what matters. So let's talk about our achievements. As I said before, we've smashed our Kyoto targets by 450 million tonnes. Australia's emissions have fallen faster than the G20 average, faster than the OECD average, and much, much faster than similar developed economies like Canada and New Zealand. Between 2005 and 2018, our emissions fell by more than 13 per cent. New Zealand's reductions, on the other hand, barely budged. Canada's? fell by less than 1 per cent. The G20 actually increased emissions across those countries. The latest figures have us at nearly 17 per cent below 2005 levels, which shows we are on track to meet and beat our 2030 target, which, we, which is currently to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 per cent below 2005 levels. Furthermore, on a per-person basis, our 2030 target is more ambitious than Norway, Canada, Germany, New Zealand or France. So let's not forget, Madam De Acting Deputy President, this is not a ceiling uh, on, um, on our ambitions. It's a flaw. We will go beyond these. As we did with the Kyoto targets, the Morrison government wants to not only meet our 2030 targets, but also to beat them. The latest emissions projections published in December 2020, showed that we are on track to do exactly that. All Australians should be proud of our achievements. Unlike the plans from those opposite, we have achieved this without increasing taxes. We are committed to the principle 
of technology-driven emissions reduction, not taxes. As the Prime Minister has said, we want to get to net zero emissions as soon as possible. However, we will not sacrifice jobs and industries across Australia, particularly in our regional areas, for virtually no global emissions benefit. Instead of focusing on virtue signalling like the Greens are, the Morrison government is focused on how we will do that. We are focused on assisting to develop technological breakthroughs that we will need to make net zero emissions a reality. By focusing on technology, not only will Australia reduce our emissions, but we will also help reduce the emissions right across the world. As I have repeatedly said in this place, actions and outcomes are what matter, and our track record is one that all Australians can be proud of. So I repeat again, we beat our 2020 target by 459 million tonnes. Recently updated forecasts show Australia is on track to meet and beat its 2030 Paris target. Over the last two years, our position against our 2030 target has improved by 639 million tonnes. Again, 639 million tonnes. This is the equivalent of taking all of Australia's 14.7 million cars off the road for 15 years. Between 2005 and 2000, uh, 2018, our emissions fell faster than Canada, New Zealand, Japan, the United States and against the OECD average. Emissions in the national electricity market have fallen to their lowest level since records began. In the last 12 months, our emissions are down by 5 per cent, with record levels of investment in renewables continuing. In 2020, a record 7 gigawatts of new renewable capacity was installed in Australia. That's more renewables in injected into the Australian market in a single year under the Morrison Liberal government than under the whole previous Labor government. Compared to the rest of the world, Australia now has the highest am total amount of solar PV capacity installed per person. We have the most wind and solar per person of any country outside of Europe. Today, Australia's emissions are lower than in any other year under the previous Labor government. However, Madam Acting Deputy President, despite the great success that the Morrison government has already had in this space, we have the Greens coming into this place and encouraging foreign countries to tax Australian businesses. Now, even by, this is even a new low, even by the abysmal standards of the Greens. But while the but while the Morrison government has seen great achievements in this space, we are not resting on our laurels. We have a clear plan to keep this momentum going. To do this, we have developed Australia's technology investment roadmap, and our commitment is clear. Lower prices, keeping the lights on, and all while doing our bit to reduce global emissions without wrecking the economy. Advancing the next generation of low emission technologies is crucial to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. Why, you might ask? Because the technologies to get us to net zero don't currently exist. Our technology investment roadmap will accelerate technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, soil carbon measurement, low carbon materials like steel and aluminium, and long duration energy storage. Widespread global deployment of those technologies will reduce emissions or eliminate them in sectors responsible for 90 per cent of the world's emissions. This is approximately 45 billion tonnes. It's about setting practical goals for the technologies that offer the most abatement potential for the least cost, and that is where Australia has real advantage. That is real ambition, focusing on the big picture and on the long game rather than political point scoring, news headline capturing that we see time and time again from the Greens. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of this urgency motion. And in doing so, I have a revolution to make to those opposite. It might shock them. Some may be horrified and they'll rush away to check their diaries. It's not a revelation to the rest of us. We know the date. We know what year it is. But for those op opposite, 
I feel I need to inform that it is 2021. One more year has slipped away. One more year of the Morrison government's inaction on climate change and carbon emissions. One more year, one more lost opportunity. One more year in a run of many years through three Liberal Party Prime Ministers, yes, three, that have done nothing to curb our country's emissions. One more year of coalition infighting. One more year of denialism. One more year of failure when it comes to meeting our international obligations, when it comes to the future of our planet and our way of life, of failing in our moral obligations as global citizens. The European Union plans to introduce a carbon border tax, which will re require Australian exporters to pay a levy based on the amount of carbon used in making and shipping their products. The levy on exporters would equal the cost, of the cost European producers face through having to buy carbon emission permits via the EU's emissions trading system. The world has moved on without us, and sadly we are left behind. We are no longer at the table. We are no longer even invited to the meetings. And now the Morrison government's smug denialism, the parochial dog whistling and short-term political manoeuvres, its win-at-all-costs mentality, but most of all, its absolute lack of vision and leadership have doubled back to bite us and to potentially savage our exporters. Suddenly the cold hard truth, the cost of doing nothing, has reared up in the Morrison government's face. And suddenly the cost of doing nothing in 2021 is very, very real. The European Parliament's decision gives initial backing to the EU's carbon border levy, levy and Brussels is now walk, working towards the US President Joe Biden's emission-busting goal of a global, global climate club. That's a club that we won't be able to join, not under this government anyway, not under the Morrison government. European politicians and, and analysis expect the US, Britain, and potentially even China to get behind the plan to jointly adopt carbon border taxes. And our exporters are now at serious risk because the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, and his science-denying cronies are frozen to the spot and living in the last century. On top of that, the EU is also insisting on stronger climate targets as a condition of the free trade agreement that it is negotiating with Australia. I call on the Trade Minister, Mr Dan Tian, to publicly explain how the Morrison government's climate inaction will affect the proposed free trade agreement with the European Union. He needs to come and tell us how is that going to affect that proposed free trade agreement with the European Union. I call on him to explain to the farmers, to the foresters, to the fishers, the miners, the manufacturers, the innovators and the investors of Australia the cost of doing nothing. Let them hold him to account, particularly when we know that many of Australia's largest exporters support the net zero target because they understand Australia can become a clean energy superpower, leading to stronger economic growth and more jobs. More than 120 countries worldwide have adopted a net zero emissions target, with more, and more than 70 per cent of Australia's two-way trade is now with countries moving to net zero by the middle of the century. Yes, this century, just 29 years away. And yet, with all this hanging over our heads, Mr Morrison has said, I am not concerned about our future exports. Well, I am, Mr Morrison, and so is the Australian Labor Party and a lot of Australians. And just a few days ago, the Nationals leader, Mr Michael McCormack, said that he was not worried about what might happen in 30 years' time. Well, it's 29 years now, Mr McCormack. He doesn't, clearly doesn't know that it's now 2021. And absurdly, the Energy Minister, Angus Taylor, decided that Australia was dead against carbon tariffs 
and was somehow try trying to twist the EU proposal as protectionism, when, as noted by Laura Tingle in the Financial Review, and I'll quote, in facts, fact, these tariffs would aim to level the playing field for local industries against free rider countries such as Australia that won't engage in real climate policy action. This government is in a state of climate and energy policy chaos, which we can now clearly see will lead to dwindling opportunities for our exporters. And those exporters are rightly and extremely worried about future exports. Of course they are. Their jobs rely on thinking ahead, and they've been doing it for years, for many years. And to also to mention the many, many workers that they employ in this country. They completely understand that this is the year 2021, and it is past time for genuine leadership and action from this Australian government, the Morrison government. Net zero emissions by 2050 is a target backed by every state and territory in Australia. Key business groups, the National Farmers Federation, big resources, uh, big resource companies, our biggest airline, our biggest bank, and countless experts and scientists. Mr Tian must now explain how the government's failure to adopt a target of net zero emissions by 2050 will affect Australian exports and jeopardise Australia's free trade agreement ne negotiations with the EU. Maybe now, now that there is a tangible financial cost to doing nothing, now that the cost of inertia and irresponsibility will hit the government's hip pocket and the hip pockets of some of the big businesses who support them, maybe now the Prime Minister Minister, Prime Minister Morrison will call the climate denying rabble in his government to order and show some leadership. It's about time. Australia needs to adopt a target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050, but we need to start that process now. We need it legislated. In 2021, that is blindingly obvious. We have known about this for a very long time. It is also blindingly obvious that the Morrison government has its head in the sand about carbon borders and our exporters with the jobs that they create because they are the ones that will pay the price. It is the exporters that provide the thousands of jobs around this country that will pay the price for the inaction of this government in relation to climate change. And this government, caught in a loop of smug inertia, should pay the ultimate price at the ballot box at the next election for their inaction and the effects that that inaction on car, uh, uh, reducing Australia's carbon emissions will have on the Australian community. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It might surprise you, but over Christmas I read uh, Malcolm Turnbull's uh, memoirs, and he, he very clearly labelled up uh, Senator Canavan as one of the, as he calls it, terrorists within his own party, the, the culture warriors who did so much to derail climate action in this country and blow up uh, any, any agenda uh, for climate action uh, in the last five years. And uh, it's the contribution from Senator Canavan tonight. Uh, it's very clear that uh, nothing, nothing has changed. Interestingly, Malcolm Turnbull also says that the right wing within his own party, the culture warriors, are also socialists. And I, I, would, have to con, con, I would have to agree with him, based on what I've heard tonight, Acting Deputy President, uh, a national senator rallying against free trade deals. That's what we heard in here, a tirade of anti-free trade, uh, anti-pharma uh, abuse from Senator Canavan. Well, Perhaps in some senses his concerns around free trade deals are very much in line with the Greens. So there you go, Senator Canavan. That's something I think we could all agree on. But clearly he's failed to stop even his own Prime Minister putting into place a, a so-called uh, 2050 climate ambition target. Um, but two days or oh, a day after that was announced, Acting Deputy President. 
Uh, we get uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce in the other place and the Deputy Prime Minister in this country. When asked about the Prime Minister's new found 2050 ambition, which by the way has only come because a new US administration has decided to show some global leadership and he's looking for some kind of face saving gesture, uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce and the Acting Deputy Prime Minister go, uh, 2050? I'm, got, I'm not going to be here in Parliament then. Uh, none of us are. In fact, I'll probably be dead. That's how serious uh, the Nationals are taking this issue. That's how short-sighted they are on this most important of issues. And when you look at uh, putting out climate targets for another 30 years, you'd be forgiven for thinking it's a complete joke. You'd also be forgiven for not trusting this mob, acting deputy president. In the last eight years since they've assumed power in this country, they have literally torn up every existing climate policy every existing climate policy that was put in place. A carbon price, a clean energy package that ramped up fossil fuel exploration, especially during COVID, whilst not providing a single credible policy to tackle global warming. And it's worth highlighting that Australia has, within this past decade, gone from being a global leader on climate action to a global embarrassment. And it's been particularly astounding this week to watch Senator Canavan and the other Nats roll out and call for agriculture to be excluded from any 2050 climate ambition. And it's particularly galling because there, are, there is no other industry more vulnerable to climate change than agriculture. There is no other industry more vulnerable. The Bureau of Meteorology told us at Senate estimates recently that even on existing emissions trajectories, a business as usual scenario, we're looking at three to four degrees warming globally by the end of this century. Think about that. Record heat, drought, extreme weather, fire that we have seen in recent years is going to get much, much worse. And a public rebuke, a public rebuke for the LNP by some of their key stakeholders, the National Farmers Federation. They don't want agriculture excluded from 2050 climate ambition. They believe the farming community in this country has an important contribution to make. And it's not just the National Farmers Federation. The national position of climate is at odds with various agricultural bodies. Meat and Livestock Australia, Farmers for Climate Action, Meat and Livestock Australia, who are potentially facing a carbon tariff, has an industry target to be carbon neutral by not 2050 but 2030. And Farmers for Climate Action also support an economy-wide target of 2050. So clearly farmers groups think this is really important. Yet the farmers' friends, the National Party, continue to come into this place and deny climate, deny climate action and turn their back on rural and regional agricultural communities in this country. Now, the reality of this situation is, whether we like it or not, and it's not just Europe in our free trade negotiations with Europe that has said that they plan to put in place a carbon tariff. President Biden went to the last election promising this is something the US would look at. And we know there are negotiations between the UK, the EU, and at G7 meetings to talk about carbon border adjustments, whether we like it or not. Even Japan, our biggest customer of coal and gas, is looking at making a decision in July. Farmers should be benefiting from a carbon price in these countries, acting deputy president. If this government hadn't come in here and ripped up the carbon tax, if this government hadn't come in here and ripped up a price on carbon, if this government hadn't come in here and ripped up the carbon farming initiative, where Australian farmers get to sell their carbon abatement credits into export markets, for example in Europe, they'd be getting $50 a tonne for their carbon abatement credits. Now, industries like Meat and Livestock Australia and other farmers and agricultural industries are facing 
a $50 a tonne tariff. We estimate that since this government ripped up the carbon farming initiative and brought in their emissions reduction fund, which has been almost a complete failure, Australian farmers have lost out to the tune of $12 billion on this lucrative market of carbon trading, purely because of the ideology of a few terrorists within the Liberal Party using the words of Malcolm Turnbull, like Senator Canavan and others in this place. They've held this country to ransom, and farmers and agricultural rural and regional Australia are paying, and they're paying in so many ways. These, there has to be incentives for our farmers to be involved in climate action. That is what we're talking about here, bringing all our country with us, bringing the whole nation with us to actually put in place not just 2050 targets but 2030 targets based on science. Unless we have 2030 targets, we will never achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Do not trust this mob. They have done everything to avoid even talking about climate change in the last 10 years. Do not trust them on their track record. Without the Greens in parliament to hold them to account, we will get nothing. There needs to be a political pathway for change. You need to vote Greens. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. I want to conclude this debate by returning to the core issue of the topic at hand, and that's the need for science-based targets. Because political reality must be grounded in physical reality, or it's completely useless. That statement by climate scientist Professor Hans Schulenhuber was the starting point for a presentation a fortnight ago by climate policy researcher David Spratt at a public forum organised by the National Climate Emergency Summit. The Greens' target for 2030 is at least 75 per cent reductions in carbon pollution by 2030 and zero carbon no later than 2035, because that is what the science tells us will give us any hope of stabilising our climate below one and a half degrees of heating above pre-industrial temperature. David Spratt argues that we need to go even faster, that we need zero emissions at emergency speed by 2030. 2020 was the equal hottest year on record, and the planet is now 1.2 degrees hotter than it was 200 years ago. And frightening, frightening, frighteningly, Regardless of what we do in the next nine years, we are likely to be at one and a half degrees hotter in 2030 because that heating is already baked in. Yet one and a half degrees hotter is not safe. Already at 1.2 degrees hotter, climate tipping points have almost certainly already been passed for coral reefs, for Arctic sea ice and the West Antarctic glaciers. And the Amazon rainforest may have passed its tipping point, and there's strong evidence that at or around one and a half degrees hotter, the Greenland ice sheet will reach its tipping point. And as for two degrees hotter, that's very unsafe, because hothouse earth tipping points may be reached at that point, where feedback loops mean the earth just keeps on getting hotter, regardless of what we do to try and pull it back. Yet the targets of the government and the Labor Party are consistent with a catastrophic three to five degrees of warming by 2100 within the lifetime of children alive today. David Spratt quoted from a seminal paper on climate tipping points that the evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we're in a state of planetary emergency. Both the risk and the urgency of the situation are acute if damaging tipping cascades can occur and a global tipping point cannot be ruled out, then this is an existential threat to civilization. And he went on to outline how, in addition to slashing our carbon pollution, we're going to need large-scale drawdown of carbon and a safe means of immediate cooling to protect people and nature from the catastrophic impacts of our climate crisis. In the light of this, the least that the Senate can do today is to support this motion to adopt science-based 2030 targets. Thank you, Senator Rice. The question is, is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it.